My name is Esbier Prinsler and I am the headmaster of Clifton Nottingham Road. Coming from a school in Johannesburg, I've been so impressed with the teaching philosophy that Clifton stands for. At Clifton, we believe that the most crucial part of human development lies within that first eight years of a child's education. You see, these eight years should be focused on allowing a child to be a child, harnessing childhood in the way that it becomes, well, the very foundation block of living a successful life, allowing the leaders of tomorrow to grow up in an education environment where the adults are intentionally looking for the champion inside each child. Tonight, a handful of these passionate and talented staff are going to share with you a little more insight into a magical school. A school perfectly located to inspire new interests and talents, where outdoor living, well, on an idyllic 60 hectare campus, is seamlessly integrated with modern, enabling teaching facilities, and where the playing, exploring, and educating are indistinguishable. A school where young boys and girls grow intentionally, morally, spiritually, and socially, into happy, grounded, and self-assured individuals. In short, the ideal backdrop. A champion childhood is one free from the distractions of modern urban life, one free of the competitions of worldly things, where the daily focus of our boys and girls can remain on innocent, carefree learning in a warm, nurturing, and supportive environment. Do not get me wrong. Expectations are high at Clifton. We expect them to dream big. But we also know that sometimes they may fail. But then, not be afraid to dust themselves off, learn from the attempt, and try and try again. We expect perseverance and grit to be as much a part of their, their days as the magic of the place. Because how else can we expect them to become the best that they can be? My team and I are so excited to field questions tonight, which will, well, reveal a little more about what makes Clifton a champion environment for young girls and young boys to prepare themselves for the high school environment and the world beyond. We're excited to share some of our promises to parents and how we go about in creating such an environment, an inspirational and aspirational environment. A place of lifelong experiences and memories. I'm proud to introduce you to some of the role players tonight. Five, two, three, four. Imagine a school where playing, exploring and outdoor learning on an idyllic 60 hectare campus are indistinguishable. Picture a school where young boys and girls grow intellectually, morally, spiritually into happy, grounded, self-assured individuals. Nestled in the beautiful Kwazuluna Town Midlands, Clifton Nottingham Road provides a world-class independent education for boys and girls from grades double naught to seven in a charming country setting. Borders from six countries call Clifton home. Central to the Clifton journey of self-discovery are hands-on opportunities for extension and inspiration in a range of outstanding academic, sporting and cultural facilities. The focus of the Clifton community is that a Clifton child should leave our gates as a well-balanced, lifelong learner with a firm set of core values and moral principles. How we get there? is an adventure in itself. We know that the carefree aspect of childhood is under threat and we believe that a truly holistic approach to education is vital to safeguard our children against the demands and pressures of the 21st century and at the same time equip them to cope with the ever-shifting world beyond our gates. We place a great deal of emphasis on developing a curriculum that offers our children a balanced diet of academics, sporting and cultural activities, as well as sprinkling into their days a healthy dose of opportunity to explore and discover through play and adventure. 
Abraham Maslow may have found a perfect case study in Clifton Notties, where safety, love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization are at the core of our very intentional pastoral structures. Our teachers teach to their passions and focus on the personal growth of their charges. Given the successes of our children at high school and beyond, there is no doubt that they have been infused with a passion for lifelong learning and personal development during their years in this idyllic place. Speaking of an idyllic place, our campus lends itself to outdoor activities and Clifton staff appreciate the flexibility and promise of adventure beyond the walls of the formal classroom setting. Opportunities for growth and learning exist everywhere in our 60 hectare classroom, from our on-campus riding school to the forests and dams which abound our estate. No holistic education can be complete without an exciting expressive arts program. Our expressive arts department comprises a dynamic and experienced team of music, drama and visual arts teachers with specialist training in their respective areas of expertise. We just know that our programs allow creative opportunity for boys and girls to develop key skills in confidence, collaboration, communication and critical thinking. Our vibrant calendar is awash with exhibitions, concerts, recitals and dramatic productions which give expression to previously undiscovered flares. Sports sessions take place twice weekly and our grade 1 and 2 boys and girls participate in a variety of mini festivals throughout the year. Friendly inter-house rivalry between our little barbarians, Trojans and Crusaders is ignited in grade 1 and this healthy competition is sustained until grade 7. Few aspects of life in any school can provide more educational opportunities than sport, which takes on a more competitive edge during the senior primary years. The number of options available is expanded to include tennis, hardball cricket, rugby, squash and basketball. And our sportsmen and women participate in a full program of midweek and Saturday fixtures. Our world-class heated swimming pool, championship glass back squash courts and all-weather indoor centre are the icing on the cake of five playing fields and tracts of open space to develop strength, fitness and endurance. While individual sporting pursuits are encouraged, team sports underpin our philosophy of the collective good. There is magic at Clifton, something beyond the power of words to explain. I have witnessed the wonder of Clifton's nurturing, holistic approach to education in my own children, and I am privileged to be able to play a role in ensuring that the same is true for all families that pass through our gates. Clifton may appear to some to be something of a time warp. Modern facilities are nestled comfortably alongside charming period buildings, the backdrop against which we celebrate the heritage of old school non-negotiables. These are our core values of perseverance, bravery, wholeheartedness, playfulness, Ubuntu, being intentional, and respect and manners. Boys and girls at Clifton Nantes have access to one of the most beautiful campuses on the continent, with acres and acres to mind the exploration forests beckoning adventure and trees just waiting to be climbed. Foraging for conkers during conquer season, building forts in top woods, whizzing down Bob's Fair Hill, fishing in Cliffs Dam, reading a book under a tree or extending body and mind on our adventure themed Project Braveheart obstacle course are all in a holistic day's work at Clifton Nottingham Road. Steeped in 78 years of tradition, the real value of a Clifton education remains an environment where a rare balance has been struck between a forward-thinking progressive education and the priceless opportunity for young boys and girls to savour the wonder of childhood. Experience the unbelievable world of Clifton magic for yourself. Good evening and welcome to the Clifton Notties question and answer live online session. My name is Pete Quinn. I'm the Deputy Headmaster, a role which I'm, I consider a great privilege and an honour. And um, we're excited to spend some time getting to chat to you folks online. Uh, with me I have our, our Headmaster, Mr. Esvia Prinsler, and uh, other members of the panel. Um, I'll take you through that team now. Um, Mrs. Jo Fly is representing our Junior Primary. Um, we have Mr. Justice Majula, our Head of Boarding. Mrs. Sally Cahill, representing our Senior Primary. And we're very privileged to have a parent, Mrs. Haley Stanistreet, um, online as well. Thank you. 
Um, we're very pleased to have you, you folks with us online as well. And obviously, with this being a Q&A session, we're pretty much hoping that you'll, you'll type in as many questions as you possibly can. Um, just to explain the format as it'll go through, um, my role really is to act as kind of an MC, um, something which I hope to rock with this, uh, this set of earphones on, looking like a Formula One boss, and um, basically to, to push the questions around to, to members of the panel. So um, there are no questions that we which we'll sort of push aside. If you have any questions from your children or from yourself as well, please feel free to type those onto the, uh, onto the chat, and um, we'll do our best to get to those. Should it be the case that we can't answer any of them online or we need to explore them further, um, obviously we'll make contact with you folks online after, okay, via email, I beg your pardon, afterwards. Um, I think then, if you've got, I see that I have got 27 people watching, please feel free to tap in questions at any stage. Um, and while you, while you summon up the, the courage to that, I think what we might start off with is put Mrs. Fly on the spot straight away. Um, I know that many people will experience that or feel that school is a school is a school. And I think what is important to know about Clifton is that we have a, a philosophy which underpins so much, so much of what we do. And that's our psychomotor program, which then bleeds into our, our, uh, our pastoral care system. So, Mrs. Fly, could I chuck you um, straight under the spotlight and ask you to talk us through our psychomotor program, please? Thanks so much, Pete. Um, yeah, the psychomotor program is something that's really quite unique. Um, we're very privileged to have the trainers actually based in Natal in Peter Maritzburg. And I've actually trained in it 12 years ago. So I teach psychomotor, which is really a great privilege. Um, it starts in the double naught and then the grade naught years. And here they do two hours of psychomotor a week, which is really just an area with free play um, where the children are encouraged to develop emotionally and socially through movement. Um, it's, a, it's got very strict sort of perimeters where the children can play freely. However, there are three rules, um, very simple rules that, that obviously these little ones can uh, learn. And that is that we don't hurt ourselves. We don't take um, silly risks. If the ladder hasn't got a, a um, cushion underneath, this is not a safe place. This is this is something we shouldn't we should avoid. And then, of course, we don't hurt ourselves. We don't hurt others. And we do also with our words, we don't hurt other people's feelings. And then we respect the equipment. So that is one of the what, those are the key key things. Of course, with children, you don't want to listen lists of rules. And really, what, what, once they've understood those perimeters, it's soft cushions, it's lots of scarves, it's lots of soft play, and it's imaginative play. And the children are encouraged to whenever conflict arises, which of course it does at that age, and right through their lives, they learn to deal with this type of conflict using their words. The teacher doesn't bomb in and say, right, you did this, you did this, say sorry. It's the children, the, the children know that they need to dig deep, use their words, and they've got the teacher there facilitating. So it really is a life skill that they take from a very, very young age, um, right through the junior primary, and you'll see the children in the senior primary who've been through the program will often sort of refer to those days with the fondest of memories. It's It seems like an absolute ball, and it is, but behind the scenes, they're actually learning a lot of life skills through it. I hope that sort of paints a bit of a picture. I could go on. <laughs> I, 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 think the, uh, I think the temptation for all of us online is, as the video said, to, to sit here and to, to ooze and carry on about how wonderful we think our school is. But Joe, thank you very much. I must just say that the, uh, the psychomotor program does then underpin what we do going forward pastorally. Um, we're very keen on making sure the children are okay within themselves before uh, before hoping to see them sort of gain their, their full potential in the classroom. Um, Mr. Majola, I wonder if I might pull you in at this stage. Um, I know that boarding is very much a part of our spine of really of what Clifton is about. And uh, the pastoral side is a very big side in boarding within that as well. So as, as dad to so many, boys and girls, I wonder if you could talk us through what, uh, what we might expect in the day of a life of a boarder. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, our day begins with uh, I wake up at six and then we then make sure that the kids throughout the house are ready for um, inspection, which is ensuring that their beds are made, cupboard space is, is sorted um, to the best of their ability. Um, we obviously have to be a bit more, you know, progressive in terms of how we get the children to learning how to fold. Um, how to keep their spaces um, tidy. Then we have inspection at half pass. Then we head to 
breakfast thereafter and then breakfast finishes and school starts around half past seven um, then the children are seen off uh, for the school day but involved in that whole process is, is the boarding staff um, which we have Sutcliffe House and Usher House and we have big brothers and sisters um, that work in that environment which is the interns they also in charge of inspecting and then are overseen by the house parents um, then the day sp starts at half past seven they head off to their school day and then school they have tutor each morning or assembly at the start of day on a monday but the rest of the the the, the, the starts of the day for them is tutor um, your six six to seven have tutor, tutor um, mentors, and these are the people that they meet and they can, you know, open up and, and say if they have issues that they need to be able to deal with or need help with, or just maybe someone just to listen to. Um, then the school day starts thereafter, and then lunch, uh, tea time is at 10, and then lunch at half past one for the seniors and then half past 12 for the junior school um in saying that that is basically the the crust of of, of a day yeah thank you thanks very much mr majula um mr majula while we've got you on the line we've got uh, vian van der Merwe and uh, his question is this what is your policy regarding the use of cell phones at school and boarding please I wonder if you can um, <laughs> I can definitely. Our cell phone policy is we have available cupboards in both girls' house and boys' house. These are locked away. Um, we essentially want to make sure that the children enjoy the environment that is beautiful as Clifton that is, and they explore it and learn to interact with kids. Whereas we find cell phones get in between that um, and. So we have three days a week where the children are able to phone. It's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then termly borders, they get another day on a Sunday at around nine o'clock. Um, it's just to make sure that, number one, the cell phones are safe. Number two is to ensure that the children immerse themselves in what Clifton is. So, Julia, I know I that that's that you have done. Thank you very much, sir. I know that spending time outside is very important for our children as well. Um, Mr. Prinsler, we've got one from Mr. Witherspoon. What is the biggest difference between a monastic and a co-ed prep school for a new headmaster? Thank you, Mr. Witherspoon. Um, <clears throat> so having been a deputy headmaster at, uh, at a boys-only school in Joburg for almost 12 years, um, what I've loved the most about uh, having boys and girls in the same environment is that sense of normality. Um, so let me unpack that just a bit more. For my boy to have boys only in um, in his grade compared to Pridwin, his previous school compared to now at Clifton, um, I feel that his, his experience of having to interact with girls um, have been taken to another level. Um, he's 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 made an, uh, some lovely new friends. Um, they play soccer together at break time. Um, I feel that it's a non-competitive environment. I feel that the boys themselves, compared to high school, um, is a lot less stress um, about what they look like and what their performances are, and they see each other as one. And I know that you know typically our um, our boys. And our girls will go into monastic environments when they go off to high school, and um, I'm very much for that. I think um, uh, I think that will bring out the best in them. However, I feel that at a prep school environment, for me, the holistic approach that that uh, having boys and girls in the same environment has been refreshing. And I've used the word normal, but I feel that it's it's that it's it, it's that sweet innocence that I've really enjoyed um, uh, seeing at a school like Clifton. 
Thanks, Mr. Prinsler. While I've got you on the spot, sir, um, no, I've lost it. No. I beg your pardon. I've the question has been retracted. Um, Mr. Lechran, or Nicole Lechransi, thank you for your question. Um, Jason and Nicole McCormack, I beg your pardon. What is the split between boarders and day boys or girls in the JP and the senior primary? We have a breakdown on that. Yeah, so currently we're looking at um, about two thirds of our boarders are sitting in the senior primary, um, which again, I'm not too unhappy with. Uh, I believe that you know some of the children Coming in uh, in the younger grades, I know that situations may differ, um, but we want them, we want to give our children as normal, um, uh, as close to a house, uh, you know, scenario as what we can, and um, and to have some of these youngsters here, um, sometimes it's although it's heartbreaking, you know, we try uh, trying our best to give them a motherly and a fatherly figure. In their in their in their lives, and we've got some excellent house mothers and house fathers to fulfil that role. So even though the split is two thirds at the moment, um, I'm quite confident that we are able to meet the needs of these learners uh, um, and these um, and these children, giving them a taste of what real home looks like and feels like uh, in our amazing environment. I, I think that also goes back to what we we're saying about the. Um the, the pastoral side of things with our interns supporting the children through the through the processes as well, away from being from home. Uh, Mr. Majula, while we've got you around and about, Palesa K has a question for you um, regarding provision for heating in the dormitories. The question is, what provision is there for heating in the dormitories? Um, somebody did once say to me, and I quote this often, that if you don't like the weather in Nottingham Road, just wait 15 minutes. So it is a topical question, and I'm sure Mr. Majula will be able to, to give us some insight there. Um. It's a case of, you know, we haven't got to that point as yet, but, you know, we're forever um, investigating those sort of things. You sort of want to heat a facility, but you also need to be um, cohesive of um, and, and understand the safety of, 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 of doing that for the kids as well and, and the health aspect. We have been talking about it and... Um, it's it's always we're always looking to improving in, in many aspects of of our boarding houses. Um, I'm hoping that answers your question. It does, and it perhaps makes the next question sound a bit loaded. How often do kids have a break to come home, uh, Mr. Majula? Can I pass that over to you as well? So, a question from Dimpo uh, Mamane Mayama. I hope I pronounced it correctly. How often do kids have a break to come home? Um. You know, it, it, it depends. Um, the one thing that we quite, um, we're flexible as a school and quite understanding um, as long as we're notified in advance, may I say. Um, the other part of it is they have half term um, to be able to head home. And then we are obviously a full term school, so they are free to be able to go. And we provide, um, you know, transport to the airport, um, transport to Joburg and Durban uh, Pavilion and the Zoo Lake in, in Joburg. So we we try and cater for for parents, uh, working parents, and um, uh, as best we can. Uh, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Majula. Uh, Mrs. Cahill, we have a question for you I'm from Palesa K. What languages, for example, French, are taught at Clifton? And from what grade? Um, perhaps Mrs. Fly can jump until if, she, if you feel the need there. So, Mrs. Cahill, for you, what languages, for example, French, are taught at Clifton and from what grade? Yes, hi, thank you, Pete. Um, so, we obviously have English as our um, language, our medium that we're teaching. And then the children are able to take a first additional language. Um, we offer Afrikaans and Isizulu at Clifton. Uh, we also offer the children an opportunity to choose this language from quite a young age. I believe they start at grade four, uh, specializing in which language they have chosen, but they can do conversation. So if they choose Isizulu as their first additional language, they continue with conversation of Afrikaans uh, during the grade four year. And that gives them the opportunity later on to change if they feel the need to. We don't at this stage offer uh, languages like French as a first additional or second additional language, although we have had some 
French language speakers actually have come to join us. And um, sometimes an arrangement can be made with a private tutor uh, in consultation with the parents. So I hope that answers the question. But yeah, our first additional language is Afrikaans and is Zulu chosen from grade four level. Um, please someone correct me if I have any of that wrong, but I think that uh, answers the question. I think that's accurate. Thank you, Mrs. Cahill. Um, Mr. Prinsler from Jason McCormick, at what age do children start Saturday sport? Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Um, I do think to answer your question, I need to take a step back and speak about our philosophy around sport. You see, sport for us, you know, traditionally, um, you know, I found that schools fall into the trap of uh, almost becoming little mini uh, uh, professional environments way too soon. At Clifton we believe that our philosophy is uh, that sport should become a vehicle that we are teaching values. You see that is a completely different um, different angle on it. We want to expose our children to as many different sports as possible. We want to expose them to playing, to playing sports that they might not necessarily would um, have access to under normal um, uh, in a normal, more traditional schooling, schooling environment. Sports like squash, sports like mountain biking, um, cross-country running. You know, we want to tap into our nature um, resource as much as we possibly can. But then we also offer our traditional sports like cricket, rugby, soccer, hockey, basketball, um, tennis. Um, and what we are trying to do with these is give our children as much access to opportunities for us as coaches and teachers to to teach values and to bring values. For us, it's about um, um, uh, acknowledging every child for the individual he or she is and tapping into what that word champion means inside him. Um, you see, we're not there only for the results on the scoreboard, but we are there for maximum improvement in each and every individual. And uh, for us to do that successfully, we try and build that into a weekly program for the youngsters, grade naught, uh, one and two, and then from grade three, we'll start investing in a in a in a in a weekend program, and that's purely just because of the travel uh, constraints that we have in the Natal Midlands. Um, but it's very important. I mean, um, as I said, I come from an environment where where um, children are told what to do, when to do, for how long to do it, um, into an environment where children are allowed to just be, and children are allowed just to be children. And what I've seen is um, something remarkable, you know, uh, is, is the more our children are exposed to a variety of different activities, the more the ones that want to specialize are actually increasing their, um, their, their sporting abilities. And I, felt, uh, I feel that this becomes the foundation blocks that will actually makes them, uh, make them successful when they move into the next phase of their lives. Um, I feel what is very unique about our school is that all of our academic staff are also involved in our sporting program. Um, where traditionally you'll have a lot of outside coaches coming in and outside uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sports staff coming in and becoming involved in teams. But we feel that for maximum relationship building to take place, we need our academic staff to actually become part of our sporting, uh, sporting program. Because the staff member that acknowledges the progress on the sports field can build on that next morning in the maths class and the English class. And uh, this is something that is, uh, that, that, that is unique to us because we've got a, a relatively small staff and we all have to pull together to ensure that our children are, well, what we call bombarded with the good stuff. We want to bombard them with as much good stuff as what we possibly can. We don't believe in children just hanging around um, on their phones and on, the, on their devices. Uh, we want to give them and provide them with things that are that are uplifting, stimulating, uh, unique in, in in our environment. That is tapping into nature, tapping into traditional sports, and also things that they would not normally do. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Mr. Prinsler. Um, a question from Janine from Swim Parker involving um, outreach programs that the school the school has, and our parents and. Uh, are parents encouraged to get involved? Jenny, at this stage, it's a wonderful question, and thank you for highlighting that. COVID has unfortunately impacted on what our plans have been to roll out a, a community responsibility program. The reality is that we at Clifton support and, and, and uh, 
I suppose, champion the idea of, uh, of servant leadership, particularly through our grade six and sevens. And um, insofar as an outreach program is concerned, we'd certainly like parents to be involved, but perhaps more in the, in the, uh, in the, in the back room and the support of the children. Um, have we got a specific program? No. Um, we do have um, smaller, um, I suppose, satellite uh, groups with which we work. But I think the, the question which you ask is a very, very valid one, and certainly one which we've been uh, chatting about in our strategic areas to take forward um, and get, get rolling from 2022. Um, Mrs. Cahill, a question for you from Michelle Rotenbach. How are Clifton boys and girls extended academically? Um, perhaps you can check in there, Mrs. Cahill, in answer to Mr. Vian van der question as well, which is from which grade do kids start writing exams? So how are girls and boys extended academically? And include that for Mr. Van Amerva, um, which grade children start writing exams? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think perhaps let me start with the second question, if that's okay. So at Clifton, we, um, we, we use a philosophy as, of assessment of learning and assessment for learning. And uh, our focus is primarily on, con uh, on um, continuous assessment uh, and yeah, monitoring the children on a daily basis and, pro and monitoring their progress and their assessment uh, throughout the year. Having said that, we do then implement a formal assessment in grade six and grade seven. Um, we, we have an exam. In grade six at this stage, we have exams twice a year. And in grade seven, we have a review on a termly basis. Uh, the motivation for this is uh, twofold. In one way, we do need to start that formal assessment um, at that stage of their school, that, that, that phase of schooling. And it's also very good preparation and essential preparation for all of our uh, children who are going to be going to high school where formal assessment is a part of their reality. So we don't have any formal assessment or exams in grade four or grade five. We only start in six and seven. And the focus of those exams is not so much on bombarding them with content and, um, and really testing their metal, but more to give them an experience of formal assessment and to teach them the skills and the strategies that they need to cope with that going forward into high school. So that's our philosophy around that formal assessment. Uh, and then in terms of extending the children, I, I think what I'd like to say around that is, first of all, we are currently working on an extension program in the senior primary. Um, and we're hoping to roll something out that is sort of available online for the children so that it caters literally to every individual. Um, having one extension program for a group of children kind of defeats the object of extension because our philosophy at Clifton is very much, as Mr. Prince has mentioned, of focusing on the individual. And so while we look at children from all across the spectrum, children with specific learning difficulties, uh, specific challenges, they need attention, individual attention. Those that are managing but need to be pushed need attention. And those on the other end of the spectrum will also require some extension. But each child needs and it's that individual attention. So we are in the process of developing an extension program that will cater to every individual and allow them some project-based learning, uh, allow them to follow something that is their passion as opposed to just piling on extra worksheets or extra work, which is um, yeah, not so much an extension program, it's just extra keeping children busy. So um, it doesn't really answer the question. Our extension program is not formalized right now. It's something we work on all the time. And we do extend the children because we see every individual. We don't leave a child sitting in the classroom reading their book because they finished the work early. We push them to improve. We push them to try something different. Uh, from an English perspective, I if I can speak from that as an example, if we've given them some writing to do, once they've completed it and they've written a draft and they've improved that draft, then I would encourage them to write something different if they happen to have finished and push that child in their particular area of strength. Um, so, yeah. Mrs. Scale, that ties in quite nicely with a question from Sally Blackman, uh, which says, please could you clarify details on the use of a personal iPad? I know you've got some experiences in class with this with particular individuals as well, Sally, so, uh, sorry, Sally Cahill. So perhaps you'll help Sally Blackman <laughs> out with the, with the answer to that, thank you. Okay, yes. So we've managed to integrate technology into our classroom really well. I think uh, COVID kind of pushed us in that direction as well a little bit. Uh, we don't have, um, we don't use personal iPads at this stage. What we have at school is a bank of devices that we are all able to use and share um, throughout, uh, throughout the school, in fact, particularly in the senior primary. And so what we try to do is find a balance between, yeah, sort of traditional schooling and then bringing technology in as, uh, as an additional, as an extra, as a, as a, yeah, to teach them sort of 21st century skills and, um, and to, 
to be a bit more progressive. So we have this bank of iPads, we all share them as teachers, we book them out at certain times and we plan lessons very specifically around the use of technology uh, in the classroom. Um, we did have at some point during COVID the use of personal devices and then we were also very good about trying to implement some um, a sort of code of conduct for the children so that they use devices, they learn to use devices responsibly when they're with us at school. Um, not abusing devices, not spending too much time on them, but using them really for the good that, for which they were intended. So yeah, I hope that helps a bit. Thanks Sally, and thanks Sally for the question as well. Um, Mr. Majula, I'm going to group two questions for you. Um, one from Lepeta and Londiwa Japi, and the other from Palesa K, both involving transportation. Um, the Japis have heard that Clifton offers transportation for non-boarders, and they would like to know which route this transportation covers. And uh, Palesa K would like to know if there's a bus to Bloemfontein catering for Lesotho and Bloemfontein children. So, Mr. Majula, over to you for a bit of an explanation as to our bus offering. Um, thank you. So, the the transport to Bloemfontein and, and Lesotho is, is something that we are currently discussing. Um, and hopefully we are hoping to provide and, 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 and reach out to, to people out um, in those areas and just to assist with transportation and, and just to try and, and make life easier for our, our, our boarding parents. Yeah. And then the non-boarders, I know currently we have um, the, the, the Howick bus, which um, caters for for um, day scholars per se. And then some of our boarders use that to come in on a Monday and sometimes to leave on a Friday. Um, I'm hoping that answers and gives clarity to the question. Thank you, Mr. Majula. While we've got you there, Chebu Saiso, how would you advise me to prepare my grade one son for boarding? Also, what kind of challenges have you encountered with young boarders and how do you remedy these? So, Mr. Majula, I'll pass that back to you if you don't mind. Um, how to prepare my grade one son for boarding and then any uh, challenges and how you remedy these, particularly the youngsters. Um, I don't say there's a specific way to, to, to prepare. Uh, am I? Um, so uh, there isn't a, a specific way, but obviously if the, the child has buy and, and, and the whole family, um, you sort of don't want to give mixed messages to, to a child. If, if you, as a parent, want to send the child to boarding, you, you've got to be clear and say, not, um, not sort of, um, you know, if it doesn't work out, you, you have this option, because that gives them sort of the way out and they, and they hold the parents to that but um, at the same time I think it's important for the child to come in to experience a boarding experience um, which allows them you know to to experience it and have a, a full understanding um, and I think that's a key thing uh, anything that someone doesn't know they fear um, and we we have a, a setup in the boarding houses which is specifically dedicated to kids of, of, of the junior primary and your senior primary children. So those are our interns as dorm mentors and the half staff. Um, and plus with the length of the teachers who keep on uh, keep us filled in if something hasn't gone well at school. Um, so that's, I think, <laughs> how we would, how would you, you would prepare your, your child, may I say. Thank you, Mr. Majula. I think it's also important to add to that, that once the teachers have identified um, any areas or any challenges, we do have a resident um, or, or it's an educational psychologist um, who, to whom we do refer any, any questions or concerns. So we do have professional input um, coming in from that side as well. Mrs. Stanistreet, I wonder if I might pull you in at the moment. I know that your children are not grade one anymore, but having had experiences as a, as a boarding and a day school mum, um, are there any challenges that you could think of that, that perhaps parents might need to be aware of or that uh, or, or how they're supported um, in those? Yeah, sure. Um, so from my point of view, the environment in which uh, Clifton uh, has, you know, the school and, and the whole environment with all the staff, 
um, all the intern staff, all the support staff, um, your children are so well looked after. Um, and from a, um, well, not, a, not necessarily a grade one point of view, but what helps a lot of the children is that um, from grade one at Clifton, they do take the kids on, on overnight trips. So kids are prepared and get used to being away from, from home. Um, and then the communications, lines of communications at Clifton with your um, teacher, with the boarding staff, with everybody, the reception staff, the sand staff, um, everybody is so open that you are in constant communication and you know what's going on with your children. Plus, you know that they are, you have chosen Clifton as your school um, and you completely trust what they, what the staff are doing and they will take care of your child. They have your child's best interests at heart and they will do what is best and they will communicate with you at all times what's going on, what they think, how they think um, you could reinforce certain things at home to make boarding easier if there is an issue. Um, so it really is a very wholesome, natural environment that those children are in. Um, my children go in and out of boarding a lot um, and they absolutely love boarding and always have from a very young age. So I don't see any sort of, um, I can't think of any obstacles um, but obviously, like uh, Justice said, grade one is a, is a young age and having a border experience is um, such a good idea because it does really give them a good idea of, of what, that, what that feels like. Um, so I don't know if that helps in any way. Thanks, Mr. Stanisfield. Um, Swim Parker, Janine, I might just tag your question in there as well. Um, Janine's question, folks, is when ch children transition from the junior prep to the senior prep, does Clifton have a buddy system to assist with the adjustment? The short answer for that, Jean, is no, we don't. Um, the reality is that given the fact that our teachers um, do in mesh or, or, or chat as regularly and as, and as often as we do, we feel that, that pretty much takes care of it. And any, any budding that, is, that is, uh, is necessary is implemented quietly behind the scenes, particularly from a boarding perspective where Mr. Majola and his team of, of, uh, of interns or house staff will come to the fore. So we don't, we don't um, necessarily burden, if that's the right word, our other children with, with um, the, the looking after or the, or the um, phasing in of, of new children to a phase. Um, we like to think that happens organically. Um, and I think that so far that, that would probably say that, I'd probably say that we, we might be getting that right. Um, a question for you, um, Mrs. Cahill, from Londiwe Zondi. As COVID still persists, what academic supports or arrangements are made for pupils? Uh, that's borders and, uh, and the day scholars. So academic support with COVID. Um, well, perhaps what I can say to you to answer your question is that academic support is a reality, COVID or not. Um, absolutely, COVID has impacted just in terms of some of school time missed um, you know, some of our children last year remained online for quite a long time. So it was a reality that they were feeling a little bit, um, possibly a little bit alarmed, a bit worried about time that they had missed. Um, having said that, our online offering was really comprehensive and uh, we found that most of our children have managed to cope really well. But we do provide uh, and offer academic support um, throughout the school and if I can speak to the senior primary in particular uh, it's something that's ongoing it was it existed before COVID exists now it will exist forever um, so we offer academic support in English and maths and Afrikaans specifically we have certain teachers whose extramural offering is to provide that academic support so while most of our uh, teaching staff are involved in the sports on the sports field in the afternoon there are some who remain in the classroom after hours so that we can support those children who just feel they need that little bit of extra help our extra lessons are not specifically catered only to children who might have specific learning difficulties or challenges. They are for uh, those children, they are for children who require extension, and they are for children who are perhaps feeling like they're struggling to keep up to date. And we are, by and large,
much available on most afternoons, um, often by appointment and in consultation with the parents as well. So we, we identify the children who might need help, but we're also available to the children who ask for help, and we're available to the children whose parents would like their kids to have a bit of extra support as well. Uh, I take charge of grade six and seven extra English. We have a grade six and seven extra maths teacher. We have a teacher who's dedicated to grade extra English from grade four and maths, and for grade five as well. And um, our uh, first additional language teachers are also available to give support in those areas. Um, so as I say, it's to extend, it's to pull up those children who are struggling and specifically to help those who are feeling a little bit uh, left behind or a bit overwhelmed. At any point, they are able to come to our classrooms in the afternoons and sit one-on-one -on -one with a teacher who can support them in really in all of their academic endeavours. Thank you, Mrs. Kale. Uh, Mrs. Flo, I want a few from Jason McCormick. What are the number of children per class in the JP? Thanks, thanks, Jason. Um, these vary. I mean, I've been at Clifton for a while and we've had our, our times where we've had 10 children in a class um, and then we've gone up to sort of nearing 20. And of course, it depends on, on, on the dynamics of, of who's in, in the area. And um, so this does vary. Uh, but obviously, the dynamics of the children go, go a long way with the big class. It's really it's a great place for group work and all this type of thing. And then, of course, the smaller class allows a little bit for the more individual learning. Um, so I think we uh, we'll have to ask the boss what the, what, the, what the number is exactly, because this, this does vary. But um, yeah, obviously, this, the, the younger the, the class, the smaller the class, and then it goes up into the senior primary. I've, I've had up to 22, and it's been a lot of fun. And then I've been down to 11, which has also been um, interesting time. So it does vary, obviously. But when, when we see a huge class, I know next year we're going to be splitting a class of uh, two classes into three because of the numbers getting bigger. So this, obviously, is, we adapt wherever we can to, to benefit the child at the end of the day. Um, so if you're looking for a number, I'll have to pass that back to Mr. Prinsler. But um, yeah, we tend to flex with our numbers in the country. Thanks, Mrs. Fla. Mr. Prinsler? Yeah, um, just to add on to that, um, we have done quite a bit of research in terms of what that golden number is, and we've arrived at a number, um, and we are trying not to go... Uh, uh, well, that golden number sits between 16 and 18. Um, and we are really trying our best, uh, depending as well on the amount of learners in the grade that needs additional support, our learning support um, um, children. So we are we are fighting for that for that between 16 and 18. And as Joe uh, alluded to, next year in grade two, we're actually opening up another um, an additional classroom to ensure that these numbers don't uh, don't uh, well don't exceed. Um, in this case, the number of 16, um, uh, and that is to accommodate the individual needs. In our senior phase, we, um, uh, we are, again, fighting hard to increase the number of class, uh, classes in the grade to ensure that the class numbers don't exceed that golden number of 18. Um, and uh, therefore, next year in grade, in, grade, in grade 4, 6, and 7, we'll have uh, three classes per grade to ensure that we don't uh, go over that golden number of 18. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Majula, I'm going to pop back to you. I'll try and conv combine two questions. One from Faith Wolf King, asking what time lights out is during the week and over the weekend for boarders. And then also just to describe what an after school or weekend, weekend schedule looks like for boarders. So that you can okay. Um, so our junior boarders, we aim for half past seven at their time. Um, it is a boarding school life, so we don't always manage to do it, but most times that we manage to get them into bed at half past seven. Um, the senior boarders is eight o'clock, um, and then our grade sevens further down the line uh, towards the third term when they have... Um, the treatment of having privilege, they go to bed at about half past eight. But it's not a given. It's one of the things, you know, we, we try and get children to assist and, and, and 
do the best they can in, in terms of the whole group and they have the privilege of having two million noodles, popcorn in the evening, just the grade seven, just to spoil them before they go. And then our weekend program works out. Um, some of our boarders have sp a sport on a Friday. Um, so the kids that are around there, they sort of go to the zip line or uh, play in the cricket net or just play tree cricket or just throw a ball around. Um, or some of the kids just chill. Um, around the bell area um, or play chess. Um, so there's a variety of things that they can do. Um, and then on a Saturday, we tend to have to wake up uh, sometimes half past six or to get to breakfast and then to get to our fixtures. And then we do have resident staff um, who are involved in, in, in duty and plus in hand with the boarding staff. Um, most of our staff do end up going to sports, but we always got somebody available to look after our boarders um, over the weekend. Um, and then the afternoon, you know, it's the one day um, they generally get to watch a movie and your boarding staff and residents, resident staff have programs um, and not too long, you know, it's, you know, we always assume that children want to be entertained most of the time, but, um, we got to balance that, and and so, you know, you have more some activities that are quite short, and then the children do whatever they want, um, and just sit around and play soccer, or even play touch, and the girls sit um, and chat around or read a book, um, so that's how our, our weekend program, and this year we tried something new called the X Factor weekend where. We invited um, day scholars to come and have a taste of what boarding life is. And I think that went well. Um, I'm hoping um, uh, the children still want to say, oh, I'm coming back to boarding, you know. So we must have given them a, you know, a lasting impression, I hope. Thank you, Mr. Wajula. I just want to pick up on your X Factor weekend um, in answer to a question from Limpo My Mami. My, I just help myself here. Limpo Maime. Miami, I beg your pardon. Do you have an open day and overnight stay for prospective students to have some experience of what life at, life at Clifton will be like? Yeah, Pete, if I can maybe jump in there. Um, we've got, well, firstly, uh, we have got students coming in regularly, um, girls and boys, coming in to spend a day at the school. Um, actually invited uh, a young man from the UK into the school this week and uh, it was so wonderful because he's never touched a, um, a sheep before you know s uh, small things and we know that as soon as the children um, arrive onto this um, onto this amazing property and uh, they see uh, you know the campus they fall in love with it immediately um, we also offer our um, uh, our prospective children an opportunity to come and sleep uh, um, sleep over in our in our um, boarding houses, um, and we do also offer. Um, Justice alluded to our in-house X Factor weekend, but we also have an open X Factor weekend that is an advertised event that parents, prospective parents, are then welcome to come and uh, to come and join. But uh, we don't have to wait, or you don't have to wait for any formal invitations like that. Um, you know, uh, if you have a chat to the admissions they will definitely offer, offer, offer you the opportunity to come and experience the school. Because we know, you know, once our, um, once our prospective children um, enter onto the premises, they absolutely fall in love with it. And also gives them a real, um, a reality feel of what the school have um, to offer them. So, yeah, you're definitely welcome. Very much part of the weekend does revolve around sport too. Uh, Mr. McCormick, Jason McCormick, um, a question for you, Mrs. Fly. Um, just trying to work out how many full weekends he has before birding and bugging kicks in. Um, so a definitive answer, please, as to which age Saturday sports starts. I know you've, you can speak from a girl's and a boy's perspective as a mum. Uh, Saturday, thank you so much. Saturday sport only starts in grade three, which is the under nine level. Um, usually, you know, if it's cricket season, you might have your under-9 Bs playing their match on a Friday and then the under-9 As 
um, on the setter just because of field space. But otherwise, there's always action um, on the hockey uh, fields on a Saturday and that's the thing. The girls play tennis matches only in the week and only from, I think it's from grade four. So it obviously depends if you've got a daughter or a son, but the boys are um, usually uh, busy on a Saturday morning from grade three. They also finish their academics only at two o'clock every day and they do sport from two to three. So their sport is not included um, in the before two, two slot, but like the grade ones and twos. Grade ones and twos, do sports and little mini festivals um, between one and two on a Tuesday during their uh, cricket season, hockey season. Um, and what else? They obviously don't play tennis matches when they're too young. Um, and mini soccer, that's, that's the other sport. And then, yeah, so it's basically you've got your weekends free until grade three, if that answers the short part of the question. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Michelle Rosenberg, thank you for your question. Mrs. Stanistreet, you're up. A question for Haley. Did you feel that your daughter was prepared academically and socially for high school? Oh. Hello, yes, I just lost my earpiece. <laughs> um, a good question. So for us um, as parents, being um, well-rounded is more important than being um, only academically um, prepared. Um, but certainly uh, Clifton has, um, I think because of the well-roundedness, so because of the entire package that Clifton offers, um, the outdoor experience, it's such an outdoor school, um, as you saw in the, the videos at the beginning, how much uh, time is spent outdoors, how every opportunity to teach outdoors is um, taken and passed on to the kids. Um, that prepares them so well for going into high school. From an academic point of view, uh, certainly in grade six and grade seven, the academics is ramped up a lot and um, the kids uh, need to learn to take responsibility for themselves and um, are prepared by the teachers in the senior primary. Um, that, you know, it's, it's quite serious and they need to um, apply themselves and that um, life is not as fun in high school as it is at Clifton. Um, but I, as I said, because of the sporting, um, the outdoors, um, the experience in boarding, the, the, all the amazing trips that they go on, it, it forms such a well-rounded child that when they go to high school, even if they're battling academically, they Clifton kids have a lot of confidence and they really tend to cope very well even if they're finding it difficult. They know how to fend for themselves, dig deep, find that grit, ask for help, um, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, my daughter, um, who is in grade nine now, was very well prepared and has adjusted very well to high school. Thank you, Mrs. Stanistreet. Um, Haley referred or referenced quickly the, the trips that Clifton children go on. And I think it's important to mention that we do go on trips from grade one. Um, just to build that sense of independence, sense of responsibility, and uh, I suppose a sense of fun as well. We have trips away from school. There are overnight camps and hikes, and that all culminates in our grade 7 trip to Botswana, which is more of a tour for a week or so, where we go and spend a week in the bush, um, I suppose doing school in the bush. So that's our, that's our outdoor program, which I hope tags on to what, what Haley was chatting to as well. Um, a question from Jebo Saiso. I have seen a chapel in your vicinity. Um, in fact, the chapel's on our campus, uh, Mr. Ceso. What part does spirituality play at school? And uh, Mr. Prince, I'll hand that to you. Yeah, so short answer is huge, a huge part. Um, we are an Anglican school um, founded on, on our Christian values. Um, and these values are driven through uh, an assembly, uh, um, a, a chapel service every, every Monday morning. Um, where the children are taught um, these values. Um, we also believe that, uh, that um, even though we are respectful of all religions, um, that we remain true to our founding pillars of, uh, of um, the Anglican Church. And uh, we pray together, we sing together, uh, we read the Bible together, um, and uh, um, all of our staff have bought into these values and uh, we teach them um, confidently. 
I must say that does um, also transfer into a, a Sunday a Sunday school offering, Mr. Prince. So is that not so? Um, is that talking about the Sunday school? Yeah. Other than um, uh, our boarders get together every Sunday, and we have a mini service um, where some of our counselors, our role models, our teachers, uh, then have an opportunity to to present us um, a short message. Uh, and we pray together, and as I said, we sing together, we share out of the Bible, um, and uh, uh, yeah, and it's not, it's not a, um, a forced environment, it's a free voluntary environment, but it is encouraged that all of our children are, um, are immersing themselves in these values. Thanks, Mr. Prisler. One of our core values, of course, is respect and manners, um, and we, we're very much, we're very intentional on the, on the family ethos as well, which leads us to saying, speaking of the Clifton family, a question then from Mrs. Van Uke, which, which I'm very pleased to see, does Clifton cater for special needs children? The answer, um, Molly Van Uke, emphatically is yes. Um, we believe that we can learn something from everybody, and uh, certainly we regard some, some children as, as excellent teachers too. So, Mr. Prince, would you like to chat more to our, our special needs program? <coughs> yes, Pete, thank you. Um, I'm very proud of our special needs program at the moment. Um, uh, uh, in terms of our little, and I call it our special education hub, um, where we have two dedicated staff, staff members. Um, at the moment, the hub uh, caters for the needs of four special education needs children. Um, but I do think it's important for me to mention that, uh, uh, that uh, the whole philosophy around our special education needs hub is family. And we believe that families should be together. And uh, all of our children have siblings in the school of, um, uh, 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 that does not have special education needs. So although we don't necessarily open up to the rest of the community in terms of speci special education needs, we are very proud of the, uh, of, uh, the fact that we are bringing families together um, in this way. Um, we've had some wonderful testimonies and stories about brothers um, now having their sisters in the school and having to deal with uh, with these things because quite quite often, you know, it's uh, um, in our traditional South African context, you know, these learners are often hidden away in um, in an environment that is not inclusive into our everyday normal schooling, and we've seen uh, how how siblings are going through these processes of ac uh, not only accepting. You know, the fact that um, my sister or my brother is now part of my school, um, but also that wonderful journey that, it, uh, um, that Pete's spoken about, how we as um, people without uh, special education needs are learning so much from these, uh, from these uh, students. So, yes, it's integrated, but it's a family-orientated integration um, that we call our special education uh, hub. Thank you, Mr. Prinsler. There's a question from Sally Blackman regarding water polo. Is water polo offered as a sport for senior primary students? Sally, unfortunately, it's not. It is something we have explored in the past, but uh, our reality in Nottingham Road is that, A, um, opposition are difficult to find other than high school children, um, and there are a few other aspects as well, one of them perhaps being the temperature of the pool in certain <laughs> parts of the year. But I wonder if it's not an appropriate time, Mr. Prinsler, to, to hand to you to just chat us through our sports program and perhaps how we've how we've adjusted after or due to the and during the COVID processes. Yeah, Pete, as I've as I've alluded to, I think it's very important for parents to understand that we use sport as a vehicle to speak into the lives of children. Um, we, uh, um, although we are um, only 330 children at the moment, uh, boys and girls, uh, it means that sometimes we are fighting uh, well above our weight. Um, and uh, we're expecting all of our children to be part, uh, you know, participating in all of our events. Um, you know, uh, because if um, we don't have the same boys doing rugby, cricket, swimming, tennis, squash, then we can't field teams. So um, this in itself provides our children with a holistic or well-rounded um, sporting, sp sporting, sporting program that, you know, under in a more competitive environment, you know, a child will, will typically be playing C's or D's, yet at Clifton he's playing A's or B's. Um, and that, that in itself 
pushes um, um, our children to actually perform well better than what th what they would normally do. Um, I must say that I'm 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 exceptionally proud of the direction that we are heading to um, with our with our with our sport in teaching these 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 core values of perseverance and grit, and uh, um, which means that our children. I mean, on Saturday to share a little um, event with you on Saturday, my 11A team, um, they outperformed their top score by 102 runs. And we celebrated that as if it was a victory, yet we went down by 28 runs. Um, we celebrated us making 162 runs as, a, 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 as, as such a victory because we believe that every child should be developing his own skills, um, sometimes in a forced environment where you know, uh, they have to play because we don't have enough numbers. And if we were typically in a, in a school with five or s even 600 boys only, um, some of our children wouldn't have had that opportunities. And, uh, you know, to see that, uh, that personal growth and, um, and that enthusiasm, inspiration also then flow through into an academic sphere, emotional sphere, um, it's just wonderful to see. We've had, we've had the effects of COVID where our children didn't have this for a while and we could very definitely see some of our children losing their spark losing their enthusiasm, and that had a knock-on effect on their academic progress. Some parents, you know, communicated some emotional concerns that they had. And um, since the reintroduction of sport um, and these values being um, pushed through, we've seen some progress and parents emotionally conveying these, you know, these beautiful stories of their child actually becoming um, confident again on an academic sphere and, and emotional sphere, engaging again at home, um, feeling a purpose in life. Um, and that really is the, 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 uh, the objective that we want sport to serve for us. We want to give children um, that b uh, bombardment of the good stuff. And we feel that sport sits right in the middle of uh, teaching values, giving them good stuff, getting them off screens, giving them a childhood um, an opportunity to build positive relationships and also very importantly to learn how to fail, to learn how to actually push through. Um, some of our boys and girls go on to achieve exceptional heights um, in, their, in, their, in, their, in, their, um, in their sporting dreams. Um, one such good example is uh, David Miller. I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, so I don't believe that you have to be in the ultimate sporting professional environment from a prep school. I believe and we believe as a philosophy that we need to give our children that exceptional childhood that will become the foundation for him to jump off and become uh, directed in his sport or her sport that they want to pursue. So um, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Mr. Prinsler. I think it's also important to mention, folks, that we do have some deep-seated old-ish traditions from stemming back to our, our start in 1942 when Clifton first arrived. And it's not just about being on the sports field or indeed in the swimming pool as we were this afternoon, but we, are, we do encourage traditions like fort building or uh, conquer, mm. conquer hunting um, and spending time out and about on the, on the 60 hectare uh, campus, which Mr. Mr. Prinsler mentioned earlier. So in as much as we do, as Mr. Prinsler said, uh, spend our time getting children onto the sports field. It's also about celebrating those traditions and, uh, and allowing children just to be children as well. We celebrate that. Mm. Um, and I guess that, that leads quite nicely into the next question from, from Matt Dove. How many staff members live on campus and uh, what are their roles? Mr. Prinsley, would you like to, would you like to feel that? Sure. Um, sorry, is it Matt? Matt. Um, Matt Dove. Yeah, Matt, probably about two thirds of our, of our, of our staff members um, do live on campus. Um, unfortunately, uh, I would love for all of our staff to live on uh, to live on campus because I do believe that the interactions and you know it's those incidental inter interactions on on the campus that are so powerful. Um, m just moving around campus and bumping into borders and you know those those uh, uh, as I call them incidental um, relationship buildings are so 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 powerful. Um, so. To answer your question, I would love for all the staff to live here, but unfortunately that, that comes at a price. But currently at the moment, about two-thirds of our staff 
live live here and um and do exactly that they move around the campus they uh they build relationships they go on the hikes they become part of our of our weekend boarding um program um i had such a privilege the other day to go on a hike with the, with um, the boarders and it was so lovely to have you know those incidental um mentorship um uh, uh, you know some of our grade sevens that would take the grade twos and threes help them by th- by the hand helping them up the hill to you know to trick beacon um coming down having fun uh and to see the amount of staff that actually just join us you know for the pure sake of it um is one of our benefits that w- that we have from staff living on campus so ideally i don't know if there's a um if there's a donor out there that's willing to <laughs> to uh, to build a few extra accommodations for us but uh, it certainly is something that we are very, very proud of at the moment um, to have two-thirds of our staff living on campus. Uh, Matt, just to add further to that, I'm, I'm privileged to be one of those staff members. And as Mr. Prinsler says, to get to spend time with your charges on a, on a less formal basis than in what might be my English classroom or, or at the swimming pool on the sports field is really, really special. Um, we, the roles that we fulfill are, 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 I suppose, manifold. We take on the role of, of pseudo-parenting to some degree as well. So um, aside from the coaching um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the pastoral side of things, we do spend, you will have um, prep sessions catered for. So we do have academic staff members in prep sessions um, for two of the four uh, evenings. The other two are manned by interns. Um, and we're really there just to, to be and to do and uh, to spend time with what, what do become our children too. So we're all over the place. Um, which is a bit uh, disconcerting to some of the children more intent on hiding tuck and top woods than, <laughs> than most. But uh, it's a role we take seriously and one that we certainly we think is quite unique for, for, for what we offer. Um, folks, I do see we, our questions have kind of dried up. Either that's because we're doing really, really well or because you're heading towards bedtime with, uh, with your small children. Um, I, there are one or two questions which I haven't quite got to yet. Um, should anything pop up in the meantime, please do feel free to email either Mrs. Kerry Witherspoon um, or indeed any one of the panel. Um, I think Kerry is probably our, our, best, our best go-to. And hopefully we can continue conversations or indeed open more conversations via email. But uh, just from our side, um, a great big thank you for your time. It's been wonderful getting to, I suppose, verbalize what we do and to think about why and what we do. And, um, and hopefully we've given you a bit more of an insight into what is Clifton and, uh, and how Clifton is and what we do. Um, the panel, just to thank you for your, for your time as well, Mr. Prinsler. Thank you for your time, sir. It's been wonderful sitting next to you as the, as the pit boss in the, uh, the Formula One crew. Um, Mrs. Fly, thank you very much for your time. I know as a, as a mum and as a grade one teacher, you've lots and lots of work to do. Um, father to so many, Mr. Majola, head of boarding, thank you for your time, sir. Um, Mrs. Kale, thank you again um, for giving up your time. And we're grateful to you. And Mrs. Stanley Street, um, away from your three children, thank you very much for giving up your time for us. And we're grateful to all of you. Um, folks, I guess that's probably it from us and over and out. And thank you very much and have a good evening. And we hope to see you on foot on campus as soon as humanly possible. Look after yourselves and thank you for your time.